Hi, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome to the final installment of the Nasher's Art and Health series for this season. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and tonight our program will focus on how conditions of the eye can affect an artist's practice. I work in a field that is often referred to as visual art, which becomes a loaded term when we think about what art can mean to people with different degrees of sight. When we think of an artwork not merely as a visual object, but as a means of communication, then we begin to expand not only what it can mean, but to whom it can be meaningful. Louis Braille said about fellow people with visual impairments, we do not need pity, nor do we need to be reminded that we are vulnerable. We must be treated as equals, and communication is the way we can bring this about. Live without seeing, but be what you are. If you missed our previous three sessions, you'll be able to find them on the Nasher's YouTube channel in several weeks' time. We owe thanks to this series to both Donna Wilhelm, our generous sponsor, and to Bonnie Pittman, who has dedicated much time and thought to its content. For tonight's discussion, our panelists are Dr. Catherine Kraft, curator at the Nasher Sculpture Center, Stephen Leptisafan, artist and educator, Dr. Niraj Ramanathan, Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology at UT Southwestern Medical Center, and Bonnie Pittman, Distinguished Scholar in Residence for the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History and Director of Art Brain Innovations for the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas at Dallas. We're going to try an experiment when I turn things over to Bonnie, which will be my voice, hopefully, giving very brief verbal descriptions of the images on each slide for those in the audience who aren't able to see. Think of it as closed captions for your ears. I hope you'll join me now in giving a warm welcome to all of our panelists. I just want to warn you, I did a nebulizer, so I will probably speak at the speed of light because I have so much prendazone going through my, um, my body right now. The, um, but, you know, practicing, I meditated before I got up on stage to save you all the fast-paced clip. Um, tonight is the last of our series, but I loved when you said, um, you know, there may be future. We're very interested in your feedback. A number of you have written to me and to Anna about the series, and we welcome your advice and insight. It's been extremely helpful. <clears throat> I, I uh, tonight, I wanted to deal with the uh, issues of visual um, uh, challenges, and they come in so many different ways. And I teach a course on the power of observation and how to help people to see and remember more specifically the things around them in everyday life and, of course, works of art. But I think the most important thing to take away from tonight is that no two people see the same way. We all experience the world differently because of our eyes, because of our history, our heritage because of the way we have had experiences. It's a vast array of influences that cause how the differences in how we see. And um, vision impairment, uh, this is one of the things that I think we've tried to provide in context in each one of our talks is that 12 million people over 40 years of age have different differences in um, uh, changes in their vision and that uh, this happens particularly through um, uh, what I learned through the study today was the um, diabetes being such a major disease in America right now and often causes retinal uh, uh, retinopathy, but which leads to blindness. And I, th I think that that is something um, that I can tell you that I didn't really appreciate and I'm going to eat much better from now on. Um, that... Uh, it is, uh, and the great gift of ophthalmology today is the fact that we have corrective vision and that's made a huge ch change. So we don't, and we have so many advances and Dr. Nathan's going to talk about that in the field that some of the things like cataracts and other eye diseases that were not treatable before are very treatable now. And so there's a diminishing in the number of artists who have um, these visual impairments. Nevertheless, you're going to hear from Stephen who um, deals every day in his, the creation of his art about um, how he does it, and that's a great question. Um, 
The, um, there are a couple of key facts that I want to point out about why vision at all ages is so important. 80% of what you learn is through your eyes, and of course we don't teach people in school, children or adults, how to see. And if we did that, there would be a much higher correlation uh, to improving uh, literacy and learning. Um, it's so important, seeing is so important, so important, it takes up the processing, and you'll see some of this in Stephen's, uh, uh, Dr. Nathan's slide, 50% of your brain's functionality because it's so, it, it is a very complex system. And the eyes are the second most complex organ in your body next to your brain, not your heart. So it's, it's an interesting. Eye surgery, Anna hates this slide, so Anna. <laughs> so this slide is an image on the left of an Egyptian man using an implement on another man's mm -hmm. eye, and on the right are some medical implements that show signs of age. Definitely, and this one was done in Egypt, and it's a really interesting example of um, how early eye surgery uh, can be recorded. On the left, um, illustrations of long surgical implements. On the right, an illustration of a man using an implement on another man's eye while a third man holds him down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is from Persia. And um, I should explain, I'm dyslexic. So if I had to read something, I would not be able to read it. So that's why Anna is translating w written words for the rest of you. This is an image of an eye with a radial blur. Yeah. So here we are, we're diving into the eye. Um, today we're gonna look at artists who have suffered from cataracts, dyslexia, um, uh, the ear infection, I can't say dacrocystitis, but macular degeneration and then prosophag prosophagnosia, I practiced all day, prosophagnosia. <laughs> um, see how I practice, but basically face blindness. Um, Paul Cezanne, um, I think is an artist that we, um, most think of as how complicated he was. He was wreck. Oh, you forgot that. Oh, There's two images of Paul Cezanne on the left. He uses a walking stick mm -hmm. to walk outdoors with his painting tools. Yeah. And he, um, he suffered from depression, diabetes, and diabetic retinopathy. And most of, a, most of us think of his complicated personality. He was a very... Uh, uh, intense in his points of view. He wasn't accepted into a large part of the art world, uh, especially the early impressionists. He kept applying for the, um, but for the uh, professional schools and to be in the impressionist show, and he was rejected, and this caused him to be very unhappy. Um, his work is, this is one of his earlier works, where um, there's a sense of, I think, loneliness and uh, intensity about his work where his, he, his human forms are in the landscapes are often um, not present, although in the bathers, of course, they always are. But there, it's as if he's examining space and time and the changes uh, in, in ways that hadn't been seen before because he represents this transition from realism to impressionism. And that he, was a painting of a house with yeah, a red tile roof. Yeah. <laughs> Next thing. This, one. This, is a, this is a painting yeah. of a man with a mustache and a hat wearing a blue smock. The background uses loose, loose brush yeah. strokes and includes the rough outline of a woman. So we're moving later into his career, and this is a very famous work over at the Kimball Museum. Again, I try to use mostly muse, uh, objects that are here in the, in the community. And uh, what you're seeing in these kinds of works, I think, really influenced later artists who looked at uh, Cezanne's work. As you know, he was a precursor for fauvism, and then very importantly, um, cubism. And his works, uh, as his planes, the planes he depicted loosened up, um, became more and more uh, exciting to see. So this is a landscape painting of buildings on a winding mountain road. The brush strokes are energetic, and the colors are blues, greens, and oranges. Yeah. And again, this is a, a, a slightly later work, and you can see the loosening up of his strokes. And so the clouds, look at the clouds in particular, and you see the uh, abstracted brush strokes pressing. Here, I'm going to do a quick comparison between two apple scenes. He often painted interiors. Oh. This is a still life with a dish of apples on a table with a white tablecloth in front of a decorative screen. Yeah, and um, this particular one is... Uh, uh, very early and there's a lot of volume and you also see the interior uh, depiction of what's a back wall or something like this. And this is a later one that 
uh, Van Gogh, I mean, that Cezanne did, which is over at the DMA, which is going to be described. A still life of a bottle, ceramic dishes, and an apple on, and apples on a wooden table. The paint is soft and translucent. Yeah. The color is golden yellow with accents of red and blue. Right. And this later work, which is in the Reeves collection, is a wonderful example of how he began, how the, um, which is done in 1900. You can see the effect of the diabetes and the loosening up of the strokes. And he is... Um, he was very, um, very affected by the loss of his sight at age 51. It began to diminish, diminish because of his diabetic retinopathy. A very famous scene in many, many of um, uh, Cezanne's work is Mont Saint Victoire, and I was happy to get an image because I've never actually seen it before, just seen it through his eyes. And you can see it's a monumental lift of the earth in, the, in this distant region. And the, this is a comparison of two works, 1987. By this time, he is already um, um, in the very early stages of understanding uh, that his diabetes is going to affect his eyes. And it is, uh, and we need to remember there were no effective medications at this time. This is a painting of a mountain with wispy trees in the foreground. <laughs> the colors are a mix of greens, blues, and peachy oranges. And this is? A painting of the same mountain with mm -hmm. bolder, more abstract brushstrokes and more vibrant blues, mm -hmm. greens, and oranges. And this is uh, one of the ones he did a few years before he died. And you can see how very different the images are. Now, I want to point out two different things. One is that I think his, I, I, many of us who are art historians see this as the natural development of his style, that he was moving more into these different planes and uh, and sort of broad brush strokes. And so it's a natural thing that his art progressed. And I think I don't want to read too much into the changes in his work, um, just being because of his vision uh, challenges. But it does um, illustrate, and you can see this one detail there, how profoundly abstract his works became in the later, later period in his life and what a huge influence they had on abstract expressionists and early artists in the 20th century. Did you describe that I one? Got that one. Okay, you got that one. <laughs> and this is um, probably the latest one, 1905, of Mont Saint uh, Victoire. And he is standing. He um, he went up and climbed up on this mountain. It was part of where he lived in Arles, and he loved it. And he, it was a scene. Um, largely, this one was not painted out of sight. It's painted from his memory. And again, you can see this beautiful blues and uh, greens, but the forms are um, abstracted. And this is, uh, again, I think an evolution of natural late style of an artist as well as uh, potentially some effect on his, uh, on his uh, diet, on the way he was seeing the world around him. Now, Mary Cassatt uh, was, a good, was a friend. Nobody, I, I think only Pizarro... Um, uh, uh, was a good friend of of uh, Cezanne, but Mary Cassatt also lived at this time, and she was an amazing American uh, liberated woman who went over to Paris at a young age, and she's the only woman that, and only artist that was in all four of the Impressionist shows. She was quite distinguished in that way, and she was a she, as I said, she was this woman who um, came. A, came into the group of Impressionist artists, especially Degas, and he, um, she painted passionately with them and did mostly portraits, unlike painting out of doors, she did indoor paintings of women and women and children. This is a painting of a woman in a white dress and dark red bonnet leaning against a sofa. The background and furniture are greenish brown. You can see the intimacy in her works. And I think that Cassatt, while she did have cataracts, it only uh, didn't really affect much of her painting. She stopped, um, she basically moved more and more towards pastels. And the reason for that is because it's a looser medium, she could do it, but she used pastels throughout her career. Um, this is the one over at the Dallas Museum of Art. This is a pastel drawing of an auburn-haired woman holding a plump, nude baby that nestles into her neck. The scene is drawn with long, soft strokes, and the main colors are peach, soft pink, and dusty blue. Yeah, and I want you to look closely at the detail of this because this is, uh, you can see the small brush strokes here and the, and the detail in which the baby's hand, the surface of the skin of the mother and child are almost merged together, but you'll see a big change in one of the last works that I'll show you. Um, here's another work. She lost her, um, 
her vision. Oh, and I want to apologize that I have the dates wrong. She lived to be 82, not um, 62. That was a mistake. Um, again, don't catch all those things when you're dyslexic. All the numbers look the same. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> but um, in um, in. 1915, she was forced to give up work because she couldn't really see anymore. That was a great tragedy in her life. And um, I love this, uh, this quote. Uh, it, it, it describes really the great uh, fear and failure she had as she had to stop painting. And she couldn't see and she knew that. And it was a, a huge tragedy for her in her life. She lived a long time. Her cataracts were unsuccessfully treated by surgeries. Um, and it was in all of this is not documented in medical records, but in, instead in personal records that were a part of her correspondent with family members and other members of the Impressionist group. And um, she had two cataract surgeries, and both of them did not completely resolve the problem. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of her last works, um, and you can compare the difference in the brush strokes, especially on the detail of the woman and in the arms, how different it is than the earlier uh, piece that we looked at about the mother and child. So this is a detail of a drawing of an auburn-haired woman holding a nude baby whose face cannot be seen. And in the yeah. detail, you can see that the strokes are very loosely describing right. the features. So the main thing that happened in her career is she kept painting um, until 1915, but she changed her medium as she went through the transitions with her work. Perhaps the most famous of everybody in this field of visual uh, challenges is, of course, Claude Monet. And I hope all of you saw that amazing exhibition over at the Kimball last year or this year. Um, he was the impressionist who was um, diagnosed with cataracts in 1912, so late into his career. And um, he also died of lots of other, he had lung cancer late in his life, but this was later in his life, and there, so there's a lot of speculation about what was going on. We know these early works, this is the famous form, 18, oh. This is a painting of boats in a harbor at sunset. The colors are softly blended blue, gray, and peach with a bright orange circle for the sun. So this was, um, of course, the one that, uh, a painting, the very impression famous one that led to the phrase Impressionism. Um, as you can see, the sun rising. Critics said that it wasn't really a painting. It was just an impression. Um, across the street, now on view, is the great um, uh, still life, a tea set in the McDermott collection. And you can see the, this early, very realistic work in his, um, in his painting style. Again, uh, we're moving on, 1880, and his love of blues and greens, you can see that that was very much a part of his and work. This is, this is a painting of sandbars in a river with houses visible on the far bank. And um, a landscape painting of mountains and foliage. The scene is painted with small, close brushstrokes, and the colors range from bright, bright blues to dusty greens. How many of you have had cataract surgery? Yeah, it makes a big difference, doesn't it? <laughs> I know when I went outside after my first eye was done, I was like, oh my God, we have a green, blue sky again. I had absolutely, everything had changed color and it changed so gradually that I didn't know what was going on. It was terrifying at the DMA because I was doing the color proofing at, of the handbook. And so they were really glad that I had my cataracts done. I was, Cause I was saying, this is totally the wrong color. And they go, no, Bonnie, let's go up and look at it. And um, so it was pretty funny. But blues are very hard to discern in this phase. And of course, this is the other great McDermott painting that's a, across the way, the water lilies, which is. This is a painting of water lilies in a pond that reflects a cloudy sky. The painting is almost abstract with a wash of mauve fading into blue and brown dotted with green and red. So Monet was deeply effect, affected. He was living now, as you can see, in Giverny, these great gardens outside of Paris that was his home. And he was deeply affected by the glare because of the cataracts and also because of the ch slow changing of his color vision. And it began, um, he began to use broader brush strokes and more um, creating a, a, a depth to his paintings in new ways. Um, he also started, in uh, while he was suffering from cataracts, the great series that you see at, um, in Paris. At the, it was in the Musée d'Orsay now, is it? Or it was in the Jeux de Plume, the great water lily series. One of you who lived... Yes, yeah. 
And of course, another, and, and these were gifts that he gave to the, uh, to the state of France upon his death. And um, here we see the, um, so 1918, this is when his, um, his, he knew that his color eyesight was changing, but he didn't really um, acknowledge it. He just was getting frustrated. Um, and in 1923, shortly um, after this painting, he had his first eye done. He had watched Marie Cassatt and a lot of other artists go through um, unsuccessful cataract surgery, so he was very afraid of it. And in reading his his, the history, of literature about his eye uh, complications. You go from doctor to doctor to doctor who all had different prescriptions. He took a lot of homeopathic remedies, anything to avoid having the actual surgery. And the first surgery um, really um, happened uh, in 1914, no, 1923. And you can see by this time um, how loose his brush strokes had become, how the color palette was beginning to change. But again, um, we don't want to place everything on the barrel of or on the stool of saying it was his cataracts. We also know that he was an incredibly inventive artist and that this change in style very much could have been what he was after. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so, we'll go back. So that was a painting with brushstrokes so loose and tangled that you can barely make out a garden bridge. Mm. The colors are a jumble of deep red, gold, blue, and teal. And you'll see this Japanese bridge in a couple of other comparative shots that I have. And here's a photo of um, Monet in a bed wearing mm -hmm. tinted glasses, and on the right is a close-up photo of old-fashioned glasses with tinted lenses. So when you had cataract surgery at this time, you had to stay in bed and not move. I mean, that was a big part of the surgery, and um, unfortunately, during the surgery, he apparently had a, a, an attack and started coughing, and so that was very dangerous. It upset his uh, physician, and then they basically strapped him down to keep him from not moving, and he was in this condition as they, for a couple of weeks while they tried to get his eyes to settle down. Um, he was terrified of the whole uh, situation and his eyes were not improved that much. And if you look at the two, at the lenses in the two glasses, you'll see that they're very different. And that had to do with one eye being cor corrected. This is when he started to wear them after the surgery and the other uh, lens being very thick is the one that he couldn't see out of anyhow. So these are three images. One is a black and white photo of Monet on the bridge and with another man. Uh, one is a painting of the bridge that looks fairly realistic in terms of color. And the third is that jumbled red and blue painting. So I, I'm going to show you a couple of comparisons so that you can see the in, uh, environment and then the changes in palette and brush strokes um, that occurred with Monet. And it's, it, it's a fascinating uh, discor uh, discourse in my mind about creative evolution of artists because I think all of them, there's no right or wrong here. It's, to me, they're all equally beautiful. What you're looking at is the way the artist's mind, in many cases, begins to reinterpret things, uh, especially an image that they've seen a long time, like the bridge, uh, the Japanese bridge. And this is a comparison of three water lily paintings. One is blue, green, and pink with soft details. The next is yellow, brownish, green, and lavender with bold golden lily pads. And the third is almost completely abstract with bright red, blue, green, and yellow blending together. And I think the description said it all, but you can see the evolution of his, of his work. And, and the mandala, mandala uh, picture of the water lilies is on, at the DMA, but not on view right now. And this is the last one I'll show you, which is? On the left, a nearly abstract landscape painted in bright gold, rusty red, and muddy green. And on the right, the same scene in deep violet, bluish green, and rosy pink. So I just offer these two comparisons, um, which are very well documented in the literature um, about the before and after the exact same scene. Now. When he painted these, I think he was drawing deeply on his memory and pulling those memories out and dealing with a, the, a creative response from his point of view. Another artist um, who uh, was close, as I said, to, um, excuse me, very close to um, Cezanne was uh, Camille Pizarro, who had an infection of the ear duct. And that causes leakage, as I understand it, from the eye and the nose, and is very, very disruptive. And, um, and eventually, and it was something that they did horrific, as far as I'm concerned, surgeries on him <laughs> over and over again to try to correct this. And there were months at a time that Pizarro could not see. 
Um, you'll see this is uh, before, about 20 years before the diagnosis, so his paintings were very much of the time. This is a landscape of bare trees in front of a distant village in green fields. Mm -hmm. And this is four people harvesting apples from a tree. The brushstrokes mm -hmm. are small daubs and the background is golden mm -hmm. orange with purple shadows. So you see in the apple orchard, which is on view next door, um, a wonderful uh, sense of what he loved to do, which is to paint out of doors. And I think the great loss uh, for for Pizarro is that his eye condition ultimately caused him, his doctors forced him to be inside and to paint through a window. And you'll see in his later works that he struggled to do, he did this of course, because he had abscess after abscess in his eye. And he had to deal with the effect of this as a living condition throughout his work. Those, um, this was just before, the, um, or just during that time that he was, um, dealing with painting in of doors. And I love that this is a... This is a self-portrait painting of Pizarro um, in front of a window. So you can see that, um, what I just mentioned, that he's inside now, uh, confined to his house, looking out windows. And that, I often think, is one of the windows that he peered out to see the land, the cityscape of Paris. This is a painting of boats on a river that runs through a city with the colors of an overcast day. So now we're looking at uh, Pizarro, 1896, with these, um, definitely by this time he is painting inside and looking out to the world around him. And it is, um, the tragedy for him was that he felt that it affected his ability to capture light and movement because of the distance that he had. But otherwise, you know, I think that his works remain incredibly vibrant and uh, his brushstrokes, none of those really changed. It was more that interior view, the, it, looking at the world from an interior view and being a particip participant in a new way. This is a painting of buildings and carriages in a town square fading into a distant fog that's a pinkish brown. Okay. And this is... This is a busy harborside marketplace viewed from a distance with lots of pinks and oranges. So this is one of the... Um, one, among his last works, 1902, he uh, painted actively up until then. Again, you see by the upper, looking, he's looking out a window again, down at the world around him, and very excited uh, nature of the gathering of people at the riverside. And Pizarro, um, you know, I didn't know this about the chronic infection. It didn't, it, as I understand it, it did not affect really his vision, but the way he had to paint, and that, that is an important part of why he's here. Um, he's a good transition to Dale Chihuly, who, um, as many of you know, had a tragic, uh, he's a very famous uh, glass artist and had a tragic uh, car accident in the 1970s where his, he lost an eye. And as I um, was learning uh, more about Dale, I knew him very, very well when I lived in Seattle. And talk about energy and excitement in dealing with life. He certainly uh, has it. Um, he was... Uh, vibrant individual in, in so many different ways. And this is, of course, the heart w windows across the street at the DMA, and it gives you a good example of the flower forms that he does. Oh, so that's 34 <laughs> transparent glass sculptures mounted on a tall bank of windows. The sculptures resemble flowers or sea anemones in all sorts of rainbow colors. And the slides that I have here, I picked because they show without one eye, his depth perception was radically changed. They had another accident where he injured his shoulder, so he couldn't lift the materials that it takes to create uh, glass. So in these, so what, uh, Dale was on a trip to the Murano glass factories, and he discovered how teams of people began to work together and came back to Seattle and basically with the Pilchuck Glass Center and others changed the way glass art is seen today. And he became um, really the orchestrator of these great uh, forms. On the back, um, sorry, on this one is important. So, yeah, so this is a photo of Dale Chihuly directing another man who's blowing a large glass sculpture. But what I want you to look at is in the back are all the drawings on the wall. And these are big uh, sheets of paper with black graphite drawings. And those are all Dale's work. So he did the drawings that led to the work. He was the creative genius. He just couldn't always, he couldn't do the physical manufacturing of the work because of the loss of his eye. And he became, the, um, his drawings are really powerful and exciting to look at. 
And I think that it brings a new sense of understanding about the importance of adapting um, when life changes and, come, and still remaining immensely creative. I'll show you just a few of Dale's. This is a group of glass sculptures on a cement plaza. The central sculpture is made of spiraling yellow and orange parts that resemble right. curly hair, and the others are dark spheres. Yeah, and this is in, in uh, beautiful site-specific work in California as the sun setting. This, this is a, mm. it's a wooden canoe filled with twisting red, yellow, and blue glass sculptures. That looks like it's on fire, and that's, um, I think a lot of you probably saw the botanic garden here when his installations were here that was quite magical. This is a tall, glass sculpture with spiraling pieces, it's bright orange. And this is at the C Center um, in, at UT Southwestern. If you've ever seen it, it's a pretty amazing piece. Um, and the water has a lot to do with the way it plays. And this is a glass sculpture that looks like striped yellow seashells nested together. Right. These were variations of the great windows, the heart windows, but he, he did these sculptures all the time. And this is an abstract painting of a green ring and flower-like forms with a blue background. Right. So just an example of that. The last person that I'm going to just touch on, really Chuck closes, um, um, uh, had neurological issues rather than eye issues. But I think so many people um, get them mixed up. I just wanted to mention he had um, the face blindness, which the way, and I'll show you in just a minute because uh, how he created that. He had dyslexia, which he talks about extensively in his uh, in as having an impact on his creative process. And he also had that horrific accident, and um, not accident, but a, a, a spinal cord. Um, he had a stroke, basically, in, in an explosion of a blood vessel that paralyzed him from the neck down, although he has a, adapted and retained use of his hands and uh, today. And the blood clot on his spine was um, probably the most devastating of all the injuries, but he fought back in, uh, against it after a year, over a year in therapy, physical therapy. His this is a black and white painting of a man's head made using dark and light fingerprints. So I think what a lot of us um, have come to realize is that his works of art are made out of these very small dots of black and uh, colored ink. And I'm just going to show you this one as a closing piece for my comments. And this is a large color painting of a man's head that's made up of multicolored daubs of paint that look abstract up close. Right. So as you move into the piece, as you move away from the piece, the face becomes more, uh, much more clear in terms of reading. And as you get close, you can see it's actually little dots of color within color, sometimes within color. And what he did, and it's, so it's interesting, he couldn't recognize faces, but that became the main body of his work. And the reason for uh, the ability to do that was he would take large frame um, photographs, and which would two-dimensionalize the face, and then he could read the face they made a grid and then he would fill in with his assistants then they fill in um, the the individual dots as he's going along so it was a, a, an amazing adaptation to what I think um, you know many people would have given up but he just kept he keeps creating to this day and is moving into new media I read that he was going into textiles and other materials that are very similar but it is all um, it is all with the human face so just some key facts um, that I, I mentioned at the beginning um, to, to remind you how important vision is, but also to remind you about the creative response that artists have. I think that creative resilience, which we've seen throughout this entire series, whether it's physical or dealing with mental conditions or dealing with eyes, is the hallmark of uh, of the way in which we can understand have a, and have a deeper appreciation of artists and their work. And you're gonna hear more about that from Stephen and Catherine. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over. <laughs> I'm just gonna turn it over to Catherine. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And uh, can all of you hear me all right? OK, terrific. Um, one thing that really struck me in starting to think about this evening is the way that artists and many of us use blindness as a kind of metaphor to talk about um, what artists do and how they work. Um, and 
these are just two quotes. Um, one from Picasso, painting is a blind man's profession. He paints not what he sees, but what he feels, what he tells himself about what he has seen. And Edgar Degas, it is much better to draw what you can't see anymore, but in your memory. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about three artists who experienced different kinds of challenges to their vision um, and how it may have impacted their work, uh, beginning with Degas. And um, I'm gonna be incorporating descriptions of the works in my presentation. And Anna, you, just, you do such a wonderful job. I, was just, I just have to say it's, it's uh, really great and very succinct. Um, so to start with Degas, to start with Degas um, I'm showing a black and white photograph of Degas in his 60s uh, with white hair and a beard. Uh, but Degas' visual uh, challenges really began some 30 years earlier. Um, the biggest problem was apparently due to a form of retinopathy. Um, but he also attributed his problems to the cold weather and glare that he experienced during guard duty when he was uh, in the National Guard during the Franco-Prussian War. Um, he became aware of the extent of his problems on a visit to relatives in New Orleans where he was unable to paint outdoors because of his sensitivity to the brightness of the sunlight. And uh, the image on the right shows a painting that he made there, uh, loosely painted in tones of brown, green, and gold, which he uh, made of his maternal first cousin, Estelle Mousson. Uh, she's shown indoors standing near a table where she arranges wet and red and white flowers in a large vase. Uh, Mousson also suffered from gradual loss of vision, becoming totally blind in her early 30s, and like Degas, she also had light sensitivity. Um, Degas found bright lights very difficult to handle, and so it's uh, believed that unlike most of his impressionist peers, instead of painting landscapes outdoors, he worked indoors in controlled environments such as the theater or the ballet, uh, or using, doing such studio subjects as bathers. Um, these two works indicate some of the ways uh, Degas' work changed as he aged. Um, as a young man, Degas had had extensive academic training where uh, he drew from the model and after artworks and drew and drew and drew. Um, and that was his main piece of advice to younger artists to just keep drawing. So he had this um, incredible uh, talent for using line to suggest form, to define form and suggest movement. And so on the left um, is a painting from 1874 that shows a dance studio with some two dozen figures, uh, ballerinas in dance skirts and their mothers in street clothes uh, who are waiting while one per dancer performs for the ballet master. And considering that there's so many figures adjusting their clothes, dancing, waiting, uh, Degas' disciplined line conveys their interactions with really incredible clarity. Uh, on the right is one of Degas' largest late works. Uh, on the left side are the four dancers of the title, uh, seen from the knees up, adjusting their costumes in front of what looks like a landscape, but is likely a set decoration in tones of green and gold and brown. Uh, descriptive detail has really been downplayed here, and emphatic dark lines shape the dancers' heads and arms. Um, there are... Um, scholars who argue that as Degas' vision worsened, uh, he came to focus more on the dynamics of bodily movements, less on the specifics of facial expressions. Um, it's also commonly believed that Degas turned to pastels more and more as uh, the trouble with his vision increased, uh, because it's assumed to be pastels are easier to work with. Um, but I think the truth is not so straightforward. Um, for one thing, Degas began using pastels much earlier uh, and could achieve a considerable amount of detail with them. Um, both these works are in the Dallas uh, Museum. And uh, on the left, ballet dancers on the stage, um, a group of dancers are arrayed in a dramatic diagonal array from the lower right corner to the upper left, brightly lit by unseen stage lighting. The overlapping gestures and expressions are sharply defined by strokes of black pastel. 
Um, and Degas' use of pastels was often experimental. He was really pushing the material beyond its usual uses, working in like heavy layers and also at size, not often associated with pastels. And in the work on the right, uh, another pastel from uh, 1890 to 95, these uh, late bathers, uh, it's 56 by 56 inches. I mean, this is a really ambitiously sized work. Um, there, is, uh, there are three figures, uh, but Degas has cropped off parts of a figure bending over with her back to us, and another one reclining has also been kind of cropped off in the torso. Uh, so we're focused on this central figure who is uh, nude and seated on the ground, uh, combing her, brushing her hair over her face. Um, all his attention goes to the bodily gestures, and we don't even, in this case, see the dancers' faces. Um, likewise, with Degas' sculptures, uh, which is also, uh, his sculptures are also associated with his old age. It's uh, and said to be uh, that he took up sculpture due to uh, his trouble with his vision because the tactility made it easier to work with. Um, Perhaps that's partly true, but Degas seems to have been really interested in sculpture from the very beginnings of his uh, study of art. He sketched uh, antique and Renaissance sculptures. He seems to have learned how to make armatures when he studied in Italy. Um, and as with his pastels, he really didn't make it easy for himself. He really um, challenged himself uh, in his sculptures, often pushing what the figures could do. Um, on the left, you see a fairly early uh, sculpture in the Nasher collection, Dancer at Rest, uh, showing uh, a nude figure, a uh, dancer with her right foot out in front, her weight on her left foot, her hands on her hips, and her head uh, and arms thrown back. Um, and this is something we see also, in, as with Degas' later two-dimensional work, that the, um, it, the expression is in the gestures of the body, not in facial expressions. Um, and in the work on the right at the DMA, the uh, masseuse uh, is far less detailed. Uh, and you can see that Degas was loosely modeling uh, what would have been wax. These are both cast in bronze, but he would have originally been uh, working in uh, pliable material such as wax. Uh, and in this one, a nude female figure lies on a bed, while another female figure who is clothed holds her leg and massages it. Uh, details, again, really downplayed to focus attention on the two figures' interaction. Um, Degas' loss of vision, which is thoroughly documented in uh, his correspondence, finally forced him to stop work altogether around 1911. Um, the second example that I want to discuss is Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, I'm showing you her in two black and white photographs. Uh, one uh, on the left <clears throat> uh, shows her at quite an advanced age with a white headscarf. Uh, the one on the right, she's uh, middle-aged uh, sitting in front of a window. Um, the windowsill has uh, an array of paintbrushes and a desert landscape is visible through the window behind. Um, O'Keeffe first noticed problems with her vision in, eight, in 1964 when she was 77 years old. And in 1968, her vi vision began to fail. Early in 1971, she lost central vision, retaining peripheral vision, which was caused by um, ex exudative exudative or wet macular degeneration. Um, O'Keeffe had a family history of this disease uh, as her, uh, one of her grandparents suffered from it. Um, O'Keeffe dealt with her vision difficulties in several different ways. Um, she completed her last oil painting in 1972, but for the next five years she continued painting uh, with the help of assistants. So for example, this work uh, was painted with the assistance of Bellarmino Lopez. Um, this composition, uh, the painting is called From a Day with Juan, number two. Um, 
shows a wide tapering vertical form that transitions from light to medium gray as it ascends with glimpses of blue along the right and left edges. Um, the title, From a Day uh, with Juan, alludes to Juan Hamilton, uh, a potter and sculptor that O'Keefe met in 1973. He became her friend and companion, and his presence in her life also made it possible for her to navigate the world despite her difficulties with seeing. Uh, he traveled with her, he also facilitated um, several exhibition and publication projects, so that in fact many people uh, were in fact unaware that she had any problems, uh, any difficulties seeing at all. Um, Hamilton also taught O'Keeffe um, how to work with clay, and the tactility of clay may have been appealing to her. Um, I, she mainly produced small open mouth pots, uh, two are shown here, both of which uh, have, are glazed but retain a kind of natural clay color. Uh, she also made a small group of uh, tall tapering abstract cones that were cast in bronze, um, showing two of those um, at the right. Um, Beginning to make sculptures with Hamilton may have stimulated O'Keeffe to return to the two sculptures that she had made before this period, um, just two. And uh, one had, was made in 1916 and the other that I'm showing you here in 1946. Uh, this one is called Abstraction. Uh, it's a white spiraling form that resembles uh, shapes from O'Keeffe's paintings made at the same time. Uh, one of these paintings on the left called Goat's Horn with Blue um, shows the brown circular form of a ram's horn with a blue color suggesting the sky seen through the hole in the spiraling uh, center of the, the, of the horn's spiral. Um, in the 70s, O'Keeffe arranged to have these sculptures cast in bronze uh, at the Johnson Atelier, and she also rendered a monumental version, uh, which is shown in a black and white, the black and white photograph here. Um, O'Keeffe stands in front of this large version of the spiraling sculpture, which is about uh, twice her height. Uh, for comparison, the original, which I'm showing you again here in white, uh, was just 10 inches high. Um, like Degas, O'Keeffe continued to make works on paper, drawings, and in her case, watercolors, even after painting in oil became too difficult. And many of her late works on paper are abstract, perhaps uh, being generated out of her memories of earlier work. Um, here, for example, on the left is a painting from the Dallas Museum's collection, a gray, blue, and black pink circle from 1929. It's an abstract painting in which circular pink, blue, and green forms radiate out from a center occupied by several darker oblong rounded shapes. And on the right is a light watercolor with a curve of red arching over three circles stacked vertically that seem to play on the abstract forms of such earlier works. And I'm not trying to draw a direct connection between these two works. Um, I'm just suggesting that um, when you look at her late works on paper, you do see forms that very strongly echo these abstract compositions from earlier in her career. Um, you know, in the case of O'Keeffe and Degas, both artists really had uh, lifetimes of work and training to draw upon as they had more and more difficulties or challenges to their vision. But the third artist I want to talk about, Robert Rauschenberg, encountered his challenges before he even decided to become an artist. Uh, and for many years, the problem was not diagnosed. Um, on the left is a black and white photo of Rauschenberg in middle age. Uh, on right is uh, the Dallas Museum Skyway, a monumental painting with varied photographic images, including John F. Kennedy, Rubens' Venus with a Mirror, and a parachuting astronaut, uh, all silk screened uh, in a loose grid formation. Uh, Rauschenberg is one of the best known artists who had dyslexia. Um, he was also one of the earliest, uh, one of the first artists to sort of go public with it. But interestingly, he didn't know about this until he was well into middle age. And before he had a name for it, um, in an interview during the 70s, he explained, I still have a struggle reading, and so I don't read much. 
Probably the only reason I'm a painter is because I couldn't read yet. I love to write. But when I write, I know what I'm writing, but when I'm reading it, I can't see it because it goes from all sides of the page at once. But that's very good for printmaking. <laughs> um, one of the things that's interesting is uh, once you um, kind of read this, and it's still, there's a lot of discussion about um, how dyslexia directly impacted or may have affected Rauschenberg's work um, because you, he, in, apart from these sort of generalities, um, he didn't talk about it too specifically. The print that I'm showing you, a color and photo etching uh, from a series called Glacial Decoy, um, shows two images of the same photo, the door of an ice box with the word ice on it, uh, and one of the photos is flipped, so it reads, uh, the letters read in reversal. Uh, these are above a fairly abstract image that seems to show a uh, staircase uh, leading up to a platform in the middle of a, of a forest or a field. Um, there aren't too many direct allusions to you know, these kinds of reversals. You don't see many backwards letters or things like that. Um, what seems to have really been important to Rauschenberg about understanding that he had dyslexia is that it sort of gave a name to a problem he had experienced his whole life. And it, for example, made him a, a really poor student. Uh, and he really thought, uh, he says this in interviews, that he just thought he was dumb, or people thought he was dumb. And so he just had to find other ways to do things. Um, but in doing some research recently, and partly for this talk, uh, but also for, um, my own interest, I discovered that before Rauschenberg knew he had dyslexia, um, he attributed some of his problems to the fact that he was nearsighted. Uh, he had myopia, which, how many people here have that? All right. <laughs> um, interestingly, he talks about this in a couple of unpublished interviews. And, but he never um, talked about it publicly. The interviews were not published. And um, in fact, though, uh, when he was drafted into the Navy during World War II, his vision was bad enough that he was not placed on active duty. Um, he was disqualified uh, because of, of his vision. And he wore glasses while he was in the service, but then he never seems to have um, continued to wear, wear it afterwards. Um, and since I've, I've realized this about him and, and uh, kind of being uh, nearsighted myself, one of the things I've started thinking about in his work um, is this phenomenon of um, when you're myopic, of course, you have terrific eyesight about this far away. And uh, one of the things that's always driven me kind of crazy about Rauschenberg's earlier work, the kind of the work that he really became well known for in the 1950s, the combines and the combine paintings, um, have a lot of collage material added to the surfaces. And um, a work such as this one is called Rebus. A lot of the works from this period have kind of wordplay titles. And um, this work, it's quite large. It's 8 by 11 feet. And, um, it's a work on canvas in two panels. Um, the overall tonality of it is sort of a, a darkish cream colored. And there is a horizontal sort of zone, a center zone that runs from right to left across the painting. Um, and there are images such as newspaper clippings, photographs, uh, pieces of fabric that are attached across this horizontal band. It's almost like this um, uh, a zone where everything is placed in a fairly regular or even, even manner. And um, when you see the work overall, it's uh, kind of see the punctuations of different uh, images. There's a kind of rhythm to it. But it's only when you stand very close, much closer than museum security would you like you to stand, um, that you start seeing these details. That is, you have to get kind of as close as Rauschenberg may have been working to see things like this. And um, um, I'm showing Rebus again with a bright pink square around a detail of the painting. 
And the detail, uh, I'm showing the detail that is uh, uh, underneath these, uh, the white and the red brush strokes and next to a photo of a mosquito is one panel from a cartoon uh, in which a character is saying, what about this paper sister brought home from school? And the other character says, it looked all right to me. Um, and actually there are lots of um, kind of comments like this or, or images in, uh, in these types of, um, in Rauschenberg's combines. And I'm not saying that they necessarily need to be read out and decoded, but at the very least, they seem to be asked to be looked at very closely, more closely than we might look at an, impre an impressionist painting, for example. Um, and the last image I would show, and this is also still something I'm, I'm really thinking about, um, at the right you see a photograph, a black and white photograph of Rauschenberg as a younger man of 1958, 1960, uh, working on uh, a type of drawing called a solvent transfer drawing where he would take photos from magazines and newspapers, apply a solvent like even cigarette lighter fluid and r use it to transfer uh, the image onto a piece of paper by rubbing it with a, like a ballpoint pen or a stylus. I'm sure it was a very healthy way to work. Um, but when you see um, a photo like this and he's just peeling back, he's looking down um, at uh, this, the surface of his drawing and he's just peeling back a, a newspaper that he has uh, transferred an image onto the surface with. Um, and he has this, this intent gaze. Um, he's really looking very hard. And the types of drawing that he was making uh, is like the one at the left. Um, this is a, uh, actually a lithograph based on a uh, transfer drawing for Dante's Inferno. Um, Rauschenberg set himself the task of illustrating all the contos of Dante's Inferno, which given his trouble with reading, you can imagine was a in very intense challenge. And with his difficulties in reading and with this kind of very close focus, um, he developed a completely new uh, or, or unique uh, way of, of developing a narrative. Um, and the work that I'm showing from that series is um, basically it's, they're pale and difficult to make out, but there are images emerging uh, from the sheet, like a pattern of light blue, green, and gray, uh, with scribbles overlaid on top of them. And if you spend time with these works and you are looking at them again very closely, um, you start to see repetitions and you start to see the same figures going throughout. And if you compare it to the text, you can start to get a sense of a kind of circular um, narrative that spreads um, out to the image and f um, out to the edges of the paper and from sheet to sheet. Um, so. These are the, um, just three examples of very different artists uh, finding ways to work when they have challenges to the way they see things. And um, I would also now like to invite uh, Dr. Nathan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you show next. me next? You okay. Next. okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, my job today is to provide a little bit of a medical context to the discussion. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is provide some broad, uh, broad overview of vision and the visual pathway um, with the idea of how things that affect vision and vision pa or visual pathway might affect how we interact with the world and specifically also touch on a few of the medical conditions that were touched on with regard to some of the specific artists mentioned already. So this is a, a broad overview of the entire visual pathway. Um, and the idea being that light and images come from the outside world. They are focused into our eyes, uh, transduced into signals by our retinas, and then sent along the pathways by the optic nerve and reaches different parts of the brain, which then process the images into what we perceive as vision. Um, so this is a little bit uh, more of a detailed schematic of that. What we see uh, comes in, it's 
uh, focused onto the retina in an inverted way. That information is taken from all the different parts of the retina and coalesced into the optic nerve. Um, so all this complex light information is taken and it's transduced into neurochemical signals, so sort of flattened or packaged together, sent along the optic nerve to different parts of the brain, so certain parts will, uh, near the brain stem, will send off signals to our pupil reflexes and our eye movement reflexes, and then uh, the vast majority of that information gets sent further on to the cortex, uh, and this is where the, the visual processing and the experiencing of vision happens. Um, and so it's sort of unpackaged in these areas in the brain and modified by different areas of the brain. So we'll look a little bit more closely at the eye itself. Um, the orientation of this, the very top part of the, the picture is the outermost part of the eye, and the very bottom part of the picture is the back of the eye, which sits in the eye socket or the orbit. And so the frontmost layer is the cornea. The cornea and the lens are sort of, if you think of the eye as a camera, that's the lens of the camera. It, it, their job is to focus light, focus images on the retina, which you can think of as the film of the camera. In between, uh, you have areas that are supposed to be clear, so the front of the eye is filled with a, a water-like substance called aqueous humor, and the back of the eye is filled with vitreous humor, which is more of a, a gel or a jelly-like substance. Um, all of these layers, you know, as you go to the retina, can potentially cause issues with vision um, if they're not totally clear. So if there's uh, a scar in the cornea, if there's a cataract in the lens, if there's bleeding in the vitreous, these are all things that can block the light or cause scattering of light and degrade image quality. Um, let's take a little bit closer look at the retina. Uh, this is a schematic of the retina. And so what this really indicates is the light comes through the eye, it's focused, and uh, it hits these cells, so it's a living biologic film. The, the bottom of the cells is where that light information is actually taken by these cells and changed into neurochemical signals. And then those signals are sent to other cells that modify those signals, and then to another set of cells that essentially uh, has a bunch of nerve fibers that take all these signals from the different parts of the retina and they coalesce together into the uh, optic nerve. And the optic nerve, these fibers that start in the eye reach all the way into the level of the brain, the central parts of the brain, the brain stem. So uh, essentially the optic nerve and the fibers that you see, these are part of the brain themselves. They're just very long extensions that, that start in the eye. Um, the fovea, which is marked here in the center of the picture, that's where we use the most fine vision. So when you look directly at someone, you look directly at the eye chart, you're looking at the fovea, or you're looking with the fovea. Um, and that's where we look, we have the best contrast sensitivity, the best color perception, and uh, really being able to distinguish very fine things. The outer parts of the retina supply more of the peripheral vision, better at sensing motion, better at seeing in dim light settings. Um, so they all play different roles. But we just talked about, that's the eye, it collects all this information, it sends it out, and then it, it gets to the brain, and you know, there are some people who say, you know, you don't really see with your eyes, you see with your brain. Um, and there is some definite validity to that in that these signals come to the brain and they are processed in a, in a very significant way. Um, and you can see this schematic is just to, intended to show that it's very complex. Every single part of the brain has a role in visual processing. So, the frontal lobe, which is this green area here, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe, which is in the back of the brain, is the primary visual cortex where most of that information comes, but it interacts with all these different parts of the brain in, in very interesting ways. So the, these networks are adaptive, so it's not like, okay, the information hits the visual cortex and then it's gonna go to these different places. How it interacts with the other neurons in the brain depends on the context. It depends on the behavioral context. It depends on other things. So what happens to that information changes. It's not always the same. Um, and vice versa, you know, the visual cortex modifies what's going on in the other parts of the brain, but the other parts of the brain modify the signals coming from the visual cortex. So it's this bi-directional flow that happens. The only part of the visual pathway that isn't really subject to these top-down changes is the retina itself. That is just taking the images from the world and sending it out. Everything else is subject to modification from, 
from other signals in other parts of the brain. So vision itself, we think about, and we think about the context of these conditions and saying, well, I'm legally blind or I have poor vision, but vision has so many different components to it. So someone with low vision or poor vision, uh, or even the same visual acuity, it's not necessarily the same experience for two different people. And so one of the ones that we focus on a lot is visual acuity. This is when you are tested on the eye chart and the eye clinic. Um, and what what the idea of visual acuity is, is you know, what is the size that you can make out the details of something. Um, and so the way that it's measured, this is called a Snellen chart, is that the 2020 line is supposed to take up a certain amount of angle of your vision. And that's the standard someone at some point came up with, this is what we consider normal vision. Um, and so what do all these other numbers mean? You know, what does 2050 mean compared to 2020? Uh, what that basically means is that if we consider someone normal, who can see, uh, that someone can see 2020, they have normal vision. Um, someone with 2050 vision, what that means is what they're able to see from 20 feet away, someone with 2020 vision could see from 50 feet away. Um, and so you get a general sense of how different someone's vision would be if they were 2200 vision. So someone with normal vision could see what they can see from 200 feet away, that they need to be 20 feet away to see. Um, there are people and there are conditions where patients end up with vision beyond what we measure on the eye chart. And then we have sort of, they don't sound very medical, but they're rough ideas of how to measure that vision. So when we get beyond 2400 or sometimes even 2800, we start to do things that uh, just approximate the vision. So we'll often ask, can you count fingers? And we'll measure what distance you can count fingers away. So if you can count fingers at one foot as opposed to five feet away, We'll uh, measure it like that. Beyond the level of being able to actually make out fingers, we call hand motion vision, where you can just see motions, maybe the direction of vision, side to side, or going up and down. Beyond that, that would be light perception vision, being able to sense the presence of light, or the absence of light, or the directionality of where the light's coming from. And then the most profound level of vision disability is no light perception vision, which means can't sense any light on or off, even the brightest light, can't sense that. Those are typically caused by very serious damage to the optic nerve or the retina. Things like uh, cataracts and um, corneal problems and things like that typically cannot cause no light perception vision. Other things that are in play, color vision. Uh, so obviously the ability to distinguish different colors and different shades of colors. So there's a great wide spectrum of how good of color vision you could have. Um, conditions that affect the optic nerve and the retina can significantly and drastically decrease color vision. We also know that there are genetic conditions where you have difficulty s distinguishing certain colors as well. Uh, stereopsis or depth perception. So our ability to sort of see in three dimensions, judge distance apart from things. Um, it's a really interesting concept um, our, a lot of our depth of perception comes from what we call monocular cues, which means just one eye. And you can test that out at some point by closing one eye and, and seeing that you, know, you can still grab your phone, you can still see roughly where people are. Um, but for stereopsis, that means using both eyes, that provides that really fine level of depth of perception. Being able to see from two different angles and put that information together allows us you know, things like very fine surgery or very fine near work and things like that, those often require or are significantly improved by that good stereopsis or depth perception that is provided by having two eyes looking at two different angles. Um, contrast sensitivity, so this is something where we look at, can you judge the difference between two uh, luminances or two shades that are next to each other? And so you can see why there's an issue when you test on the Snellen chart, you're really testing dark black against bright white, right? You're not really assessing contrast sensitivity issues and things like that, so there's a lot of information that's lost. Um, it's probably really hard to see. I can't tell if in this lighting you can tell, but there are letters all the way to the bottom here. Um, and so these are all decreasing levels of contrast sensitivity. Um, and in practice, it means, you know, how good can you sense one object from another, one object from the background, one object from something next to each other, and, um, and that can even vary significantly in the lighting conditions. So some conditions affect your contrast sensitivity in dim lighting, 
but not as much early on in bright lighting. So some people may, with a certain condition, may do really poorly in dim lighting, but if you give enough light, their vision functions much better. Um, so you can imagine that that could make a big difference for them. Uh, peripheral vision, obviously, for things like driving and just getting around, uh, peripheral vision is important. There are conditions that can affect generally, broadly, peripheral vision and cause constriction. Uh, but there are many conditions that can affect uh, peripheral vision in other ways. So that's what this shows. Depending on what part of the brain is affected, um, it can affect your visual field in different ways. Broadly speaking, uh, in front of one part of the brain, which is called the optic chiasm, the fibers all affect either one eye or another eye. So if you have an issue there, it's only going to affect one eye or the other eye. Behind that, uh, it can affect one side of the world. So, you know, uh, the right side of the world, or your right side of your visual field, or your left side of your visual field. And so if you have pathology or damage there, you could have just not be able to see the right side of your vision or not be able to see the left side of your vision. So you can have different types of visual field defects there. Um, eye movement, eye alignment, you know, if your eyes are not aligned, uh, obviously you would potentially sacrifice the stereopsis, the fine depth perception, but you can have double vision, which is obviously very bothersome. Um, and then the bottom photo is depicting something called nystagmus, which is a rhythmic beating of the eye. And as you can imagine, one of the issues they have is something called oscillopsia, which is it's very hard to see fine details of something if it's not still. Um, and so if you're trying to read something and it's basically moving the whole time, it can basically, even though they have a normal eye, it can uh, detract from what they're actually functionally able to see. And then glare is, you know, lights becoming more diffuse and, and decreasing the quality of your vision. We see this very commonly in things like cataracts and corneal issues, even sometimes severe dry eye can cause significant glare. Um, other things that can affect the experience of vision loss as a person, what is it like to have vision loss? So timing of vision loss, some people are born with, with uh, visual disabilities versus someone who has become very accustomed to using certain vision uh, for certain tasks, it can be a very significantly different experience if you've had something and relied on something and now lose it um, later on in life. The pace of the vision loss uh, can be, it can have different effects, right? If it's a very slow, gradual effect, like Bonnie had mentioned, sometimes you don't even notice that things have changed that much because it happens so gradually day after day after day over years. Uh, but one of the things is sometimes if you're aware of it, you have a little bit more ability to adapt to those things over time than if uh, you lose your vision all of a sudden. There are conditions where you can literally pinpoint the exact moment of vision loss, and that can be very difficult. Other things, other personality factors, other past experience, other medical issues. You know, some people have balance issues, walking issues, and they rely heavily on their vision to allow them to do those tasks and you lose your vision on top of that, that's a very different experience. And same thing, you have vision loss and you have also hearing loss. You don't have the same kinds of faculties to leverage to help uh, adjust for those things and that can be a challenge. And then obviously some of the mental health things, you know, how do you process these feelings of loss and things like that, anxiety, depression play significant roles in what is the actual experience of a of, of visual disability. So the last part is just to talk about some of these medical specific conditions. So this is about cataracts. So uh, among others, we talked about Monet having had cataracts. This is a clouding of the lens, which is essentially a normal aging change. So most, almost everyone has this. It's just a, a matter of degree or spectrum. And so what this first image on the top is depicting is different stages of density of the cataract. And so it's a cross section. The light is actually cutting through the lens or cataract. So in one, you can see it's almost kind of clear. You see it becoming a little bit more yellowish white. And in, the, in this last one, it's, it's much more clearly yellowish white in the center. Um, this picture over here is a, a picture of a cortical cataract. You see these little spoke-like changes, and that causes a lot of glare when you have those. And then this last one is, is an example of what we call a white or a mature cataract, which is essentially so optically opaque that you can't really see in, and as, as such, the patient can't really uh, see the world either. Um, and so it's a huge spectrum of disease. And in, in the United States, we still see many mature cataracts. But most people get these addressed much earlier now, and so often don't progress to the levels of disability uh, that are seen either in the past or in other parts of the world. Um, and 
like Bonnie mentioned, is pretty fixable and actually pretty safe, uh, very advanced surgery at this point, to the point that the most modern paradigms are, uh, you know, we're not worried about, that's not to say that you can't have problems with cataract surgery, but most people aren't worried about, is it going to end up okay? It's, you know, can I not wear glasses ever again after cataract surgery, things like that. So it's come a very long way in a fairly short period of time. Um, this is an example of some of the changes you might see with cataracts. So early on, you may just have a change in glasses prescription. Typically, that means often becoming more nearsighted over time. You can have a decrease in visual acuity on the eye chart. You can have a decrease in contrast sensitivity, increased glare. Uh, we talked about, in the context of these artists, uh, change in color vision, which is often very subtle and gradual over time. But usually, it's the shorter wavelengths, so greens and blues, that are affected more uh, by cataract. Uh, decrease in brightness overall, and some people can even have double vision or shadowing in one eye from cataracts. Macular degeneration is a chronic progressive condition that affects the central retina. Um, it is typically, uh, the hallmark of it is these collection, uh, collections under the retina called drusen, and uh, over time, you can see a very large spectrum of disease, but over time, it can cause damage to the actual cells of the retina. Um, there are different kinds of it. Uh, most in kind of common parlance, we talk, talk about dry versus wet macular degeneration. The main distinction being in wet, you have abnormal blood vessels that have grown through from underneath the retina that cause bleeding and swelling and often are more associated with more profound vision loss. But this last picture on the bottom is, is a form of dry macular degeneration that is, causes a significant amount of disability. That's where we call uh, geographic atrophy, so they have an area of significant damage that causes a, a large blind spot in their vision. So both kinds can be very significant in causing disability. Um, typically, most patients with macular degeneration suffer from an issue of central vision. So they have a central blind spot, decreased central acuity, uh, but they can also have difficulty with contrast sensitivity, especially in dim light settings, and particular difficulty with reading and near work these blind spots can particularly affect those things. Um, optic neuritis is, uh, is a type of inflammation of the optic nerve. This is a condition that uh, Stephen has been affected by. Um, there are many potential causes of that, um, but the most common association is with autoimmune disease that affects the, the myelin, the sheath around the nerve fibers that causes the nerve fibers not to work and not to conduct. Um, and this is a picture showing an arrow where you see enhancement or uptake of contrast in the optic nerve while it's acutely inflamed. Um, it can cause decreased vision, color vision, contrast sensitivity, peripheral vision loss, decreased brightness. It's a wide spectrum. Some people can be very mildly affected. Some people can be very, very profoundly affected. And the last part we'll talk about is uh, prosopagnosia. We talked about Chuck Close. Uh, it's essentially thought to be damage to the occipital lobes or the temporal lobes. So uh, the back part of the brain or sort of this, uh, this part here uh, on the side of the brain. Um, and this is what allows us to take that visual information and apply it in a way to recognize faces. Um, there's a significant uh, variety or, or spectrum. Uh, some patients can actually look at two pictures of two faces and not really be able to tell if they're different or not. Um, and some can, can look at faces and say, uh, they can recognize these two different emotions, but still can't recognize the person. And so depending on what part of the pathway is affected, it can be more or less traumatic for that patient and affect them in different ways. Um, that's all I have, and uh, mm -hmm. I'll turn it over to Stephen. All right. Well, uh, this will be a very different presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk um, more personally and show a few works, not a lot. Um, when we had started planning initially, I know that um, you know, some of the time frame I saw wasn't for um, um, you know, a long portion to talk about the work. And so I only sent a few, but I also really think for me, I wanted to talk more about my own experiences and my own strategies and my own sort of ways of making things more than, um, you know, going through a sort of typical artist talk, because this is not the kind of typical thing that I usually do in terms of my own work. Um, I will tell you, um, nice to follow you. Uh, I've been um, lucky over the years. 
uh, lived in Chicago for a long time, but in you know various medical settings to be treated very well and by all medical professionals and I'm very much and grateful to um, the help I've gotten. But I will tell you one funny moment I had, which is that um, early on when I had my vision loss, that it wasn't certain what um, the problem was, but it was very sudden. It was first my right eye and then my left eye in a short amount of time. I'd always, always worn glasses and I went to the ophthalmologist and said, I, I think, um, you know, there's I think there's something wrong with the prescription or something and you know this had been just however long it took to fill the glasses prescription and then they gave me one of those exams and I said you know what can you see up here and I was like and I was like, where um, and they said oh well this is not good because um, it was so sudden in any case I went to the um, hospital quickly <laughs> saw my doctor's um, neuro ophthalmologist partner who said, we don't know what this is, and it could be eight, nine, ten things, but we treat basically all of them with high-dose steroids. So I was like, oh, all right. And I'm sure they gave me a bunch of, um, you know, warnings about what things would be, and I probably was just, you know, kind of in a daze and didn't listen. In any case, fast forward a couple of years, and I was having back problems, which turned into the fact that after seeing an orthopedist that I really didn't have back problems, I had no, no hip joints left, which was a result of the high-dose steroids. Um, so what I'm leading up to is, um, so when you get the preparatory thing for what you uh, do for um, the hip replacements, I was sitting in a um, clinic with a bunch of people about to have the same operation, and they're giving you sort of like, you can do this, don't do this, you know, this is what's going to hurt, this is when you have to, you know, what what to expect, basically. And a very nice person was coming down the row with a clipboard and handing out clipboards saying, fill this out, fill this out, fill this out. And at that point, you know, my vision was pretty much like it is now, but I can't see forms at all. I can't, I can't see what's on this. Um, I mean, I know that there's something there, but I can't read it. And um, person was handing them out. People were starting to fill out their things. And um, um, I, I said to the woman, I said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I, I can't see this. I'll need some help filling it out. She just kept going. It was like, it was so weird. Uh, I said, you know, sorry, I, I, I can't see this. You know, you, you need to help me fill this out. And the um, person kept going. And finally, and finally, she's like, why is he making whatever? Finally, I just decided, well, I'm just going to speak more loudly. And I said, I really can't see this. You've got to help me. I'm legally blind. And she went, oh, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. She goes, I'm going deaf. I couldn't hear you. <laughs> And she goes, but, but I, didn't want, I don't want anybody here to know because I need my job. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, what I, the point of that is that we all hide out in different ways. Um, and, um, you know, thinking about this event, um, I really had to go back over the number of times that I do think about my vision loss in regard to how I make art. I've had um, exhibitions. One was probably the most notable was um, at Gallery 400 at University of Illinois Chicago that uh, was called With Reasonable Accommodation. And it was very directly about um, navigating um, an urban environment or a cultural, cultured place um, as a vision impaired person. And it was complete with um, walkers hanging in the air and images of you know, blind people and obstacles, a lot of obstacles. And, um, and then AIDS, you know, I made a bright green ramp that went directly into the wall, so you kind of went up and got nowhere. And, you know, so it was meant to be a little bit um, ironic about how, the, how life and sp space is structured, but how sometimes the things that are meant to help somebody are, are just, and just don't do anything. You know, it's just kind of pointless. But I've also done things... Last year, uh, I teach at UTA, and last year um, there's a, an initiative in our department about um, in the College of Liberal Arts and the Medical Humanities, and there was a course taught with um, one of our historians, uh, Beth Wright, and um, some people who you know kind of crossed over into um, medical professionals, and I um, was talking about sort of all the same things that you saw uh, on the screen uh, here, um, and I've taught classes. Um, about um, 
characters in films de being, you know, depicting um, blind people. Um, and, you know, so it's, it comes up, but to be honest with you, I don't think about it a lot. And um, to be even more honest with you, I don't really like thinking about it very much. Um, I was going back over and trying to select some work to show, and I just kind of went with things that are very recent and not um, things that are, you know, as explicitly discursively about disability or vision loss, but are really something that um, I felt in some ways showed aspects of the way that I work. Um, and, um, and I was thinking about, you know, going back over earlier work and later work and things like that. Um, and I realized that I had uh, been making work and had some of my first um, solo exhibitions 40 years ago. Um, and it feels kind of recent, you know, just in the way it just feels pretty recent that I've lost vision, but it's actually been 25 years. And so I've been making work, you know, as a blind person for, you know, much longer, or not much, but it, over half as much time as I have been as a, when I was a sighted person. Um, so it, 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 it really hadn't occurred to me in that way because I really don't think about it. Um, and um, I will say, you know, the, it's come up a lot about just vision correction. I, I, I will say well, my one little resentment, besides not being able to read in bed, which is, you know, something I, I miss, but is, um, you know, I, I lost my vision, um, um, you know, I used to wear glasses because I was nearsighted, and um, but you know I, now all the cool glasses out there I can't wear them anymore. So I, I, I'm <laughs> thinking about just getting some glasses and whatever, but I think that would probably people who now know me would probably freaked out about that. So, um, but as many times as um, I do have to ask for help from somebody, and often the response is, "Oh, I forgot your glasses, huh?" It's like, oh. Is that a new invention? I didn't. I've never known about those. So, you know, so I mean, there are different, difficult things being somebody who in some ways is partially sighted because I can get around in many ways and I can um, navigate the world and do many things um, and I can make art. Um, but it's, um, it, it's, it's a difficult thing sometimes. Um, I think you know it's come up, and in the title of the um, event, that um, the whole idea of seeing with the brain. I think you know that's the neurological things that happen, and, and, and all the various lobes, et cetera, et cetera. But I think in some ways, what's also really being talked about is that it's seeing with the mind. And um, a lot of my work has relied on um, what might be thought of as mental strategies, as tactics, as procedures that I go through um, to try to say something about the world. Um, but it's something where, for me at this point, it's much more about the point that's being made. It's the possibility for the potential for making meaning. It's about the ways that I can emotionally reach an audience um, and make connections in that way much more sometimes than it is about um, a certain kind of exactitude or a certain kind of things that, that we look to artists normatively as thinking about in terms of technique or skill, um, which, you know, in my own warped way, are, I find sometimes maybe a little bit overrated. Uh, yeah, I will. Um, so I'll show you some things. Um, Um, I, as I say, I just picked a, a there's, it's going to be real short, folks, don't worry, it's only going to be six inches, but I, it's a good place to start in that it's one of those things that I do get asked about a lot, which is sometimes it's either a situation where somebody says, um, uh, they kind of ignore whatever the situation is, or they sort of get the thing where it's like, oh, I don't know how you do this as not seeing, and it's like, so I like to come at things often a little obliquely, a little indirectly. So um, I um, made a bunch of these 
um, kind of postery things that have cut out and collage, and then some text, which I like to use a lot as a kind of way of talking about understanding, which is something that people accept or think of as um, the normal way that we understand each other is with language. But I use this um, quotation from a, a song by Mary J. Blige of Too Strong for Too Long. And I just think of it as this kind of thing where, um, you know, there are a lot of things I can't do, but there are a lot of things that I can. So it's an interesting place for me to start in that regard. Um, I will say that um, I'm usually pretty okay and really enjoy talking about my work. <laughs> I don't have any problem with it, but you, talking about it through the the angle of I'm trying to resist a bunch of uh, puns, but uh, so through the the um, focus lens, well, you know, you know, so, um, you know, but talking about it in regards to this issue. Um, it's not something I'm good at. I don't really know how to say why I make exactly some of the things I make as they regard vision loss, because I don't make things I think you know, specifically about that. So I only chose a, few, chose a few pieces to sort of get there. And in, as after um, you're hearing the experts, um, I'm a very unreliable narrator in talking about myself. So um, um, this is a, a small piece. And um, I, was, I chose it because I think it um, shows a couple of things that I know are true for a lot of pieces that I have been making. One is this uh, motif of using this big black dead spot. Um, and while it's not something that I do experience, it's something that I, I know I think about as a kind of blockage, as a kind of covering over, as a kind of prevention. It's, a pla it's an inaccessible place. It's a... Um, thing that prevents somebody from getting somewhere else. And those are all things I would say are metaphors for some of the things that I think about in terms of my own experience. Um, I, the, the base of the piece is a, an old, about a little over a hundred year old piece of um, uh, music paper. Pardon me, sheet music. And I like the idea of using old paper right now. Um, in the way that it is frail, it's old, it um, just shows the wear and tear of age. And it, um, when you go, start going through some of those things mentally, talking about those qualities, it seems to reflect very much on what it's like to be in a possibly fragile, getting frailer, older, uh, a body that is showing the, the, wear, the, age and, the wear and tear of age. So that's something that's really important to me in terms of old paper. Um, and then more old paper. Um, this is a, um, a, a larger piece. It's about um, 40 by 50, and it's a, a painting. It's a stretch canvas. And um, it relies on what, for me, are um, a kind of, um, again, sort of motifs of um, kind of typical modernist painting, uh, early geometric abstraction, kind of things like that. But I wanted to also put it with this sort of very gray, kind of almost um, flat, you know, kind of uninflected color next to the sort of brightness of the other to kind of talk about some of the things you were talking about in terms of just those distinctions. But the centerpiece of, of the piece is this large sheet of newspaper, which is um, about 70 years old. And um, it is both, um, it's in pretty good shape for old newspaper, and it's been put through layers and layers and layers of acrylic medium and things like that, to kind of preserve it a little bit. But it's also um, a socialist newspaper for the United States, and it says on the Daily Worker, um, which for me, it um, called up um, a lot of the same era that like an early European modernist painting of geometric abstraction, uh, no, abstraction would have, but then also just that expression of daily work. And that's the name of the painting. Um, and it's um, something that, you know, in the context of the socialist newspaper was about sort of the celebration of uh, workers' rights and working class. 
But for me, it carried with it the double meaning of also of just the amount of work it takes to sort of get through some of these things that um, I go through as a disabled person. The sort of daily aspect of the fact that I try to make some kind of addition to a drawing or a painting or something every day to sort of keep that that going for me. And so the thing had that kind of way of calling, um, making one think of, again, these qualities of, of oldness and frailty that I think is carried by um, old paper, but then the sort of linguistic play of what goes on in the title of the, uh, of the piece as well. Um, this is, uh, I th this painting is called Scotoma. <laughs> uh, and again, it carries with it that um, um, uh, big black blockage. Um, the word means blind spot. Um, I, I had early on did lose some central things and whatever, but I don't have blind spots now and it's saying, but it, it's just one of those things that carries with it um, some meaning for me uh, in terms of the, again, the play of the language and the titling and things like that. It's also something that um, um, is used often, uh, the term gets double meaning in terms of literary criticism and literary theory. Notably, writers like Paul DeMond wrote about the way that, that interpreters have blind spots to what they can use when they interpret a text, that their, their own conditioning sometimes blocks them from seeing something in the text that's just right in front of them, maybe. Um, and so it's the kind of thing, again, that playing on a double meaning and those kinds of things that um, I wanted to um, call attention to in this. Uh, and then uh, this is a very similar one to the last one, but it also has something that I've been playing with a lot, which it has um, just a lot of very tactile material. It's got layers and layers of coffee grounds, which for me conjure up both the using non-traditional materials, um, but then also the way that even just listing coffee and coffee grounds in a, in a materialist you know, thing, I think it, it gives you a kind of mental sense of, of scent, of aroma, and those kinds of things. So it's a way of me activating what it is to sort of be a, um, a sensory person. Uh, it also has um, something that I've used a lot, in fact, not too far from here in the Sculpture garden, but um, a lot of eggshells in it, which again, for me, become this kind of marker, this emblem, this uh, dramatization of a fragile existence. I mean, it's broken easily, brokenness in general. The way that while eggs are um, not the exact shape of an eye, but they have that kind of sense of uh, referring to that kind of roundness, but then using the shell as a way of metaphorizing that idea of a broken eye and that kind of thing. So it's something that gets used in that way. I, that might be the last one. Oh, no, there's one big one, which um, I, um, this one's 80 by 60, and it's also stretch canvas. Um, this one I put in, again, because it has a lot of those same materials. This is what I was talking about in terms of the last piece, which is a lot of tactile things, a lot of collage, um, coffee grounds, eggshells, and things like that. But then it also calls into mind the things that I've been making a lot, which to me play on the notion of like making a sign or a, a kind of like linguistic uh, marker for something. And it's that kind of um, word play that I like to uh, engage in as a way of talking about sort of like how we understand things in that regard. Um, that's probably enough about this one. So. Thanks. Okay. Well, you all have been. Stephen, here's your phone. Somebody, yeah. Oh, that's your. Oh, okay. It's not mine. It's not red. Um, I want to thank everybody for your patience. I know the presentations have gone longer than usual, and um, many. Anna and I are afraid that those of you parked at the Dallas Museum of Art may need to exit with us, but if you have the patience and want to stay on to ask some questions, we can do that for a few minutes. So I just want to get a sense of the audience. I feel like I should ask you to all stand up and stretch, but it's been an event-filled evening. So um, are there questions? I'm just looking, or what should we do? There are no questions. There are escapes. Huh? 
What, Anna? If are there really no questions? Okay. Well, I want to first thank Jeremy Strick and uh, his uh, invitation to do this series. It was really his idea, and Anna and the curators, Catherine tonight, and and Jed and uh, Lee, have, for all their participation. The wonderful group of physicians over the past four weeks who've generously shared their ideas and insights, and two artists, John Pamar and Stephen, tonight, um, who have given us insight into the actual experience of their works of art and how they're created. It's been an, an extraordinary uh, opportunity to learn new things for me, and I want to thank you all for your exciting uh, presence in these galleries. We didn't know anybody would show up, so it was wonderful to see Full House many times, and to thank you deeply for this opportunity to bring together the arts and the sciences in new ways. Um, several of us will be staying on if you wish to ask us any in questions individually. We're up here in the front. Otherwise, I want to um, again express my deep gratitude for your patience and your interest in this topic. Thank you.